Yes, good afternoon to everyone. Good evening, maybe for some, even good morning. Um, well, thank you very much for many, I think, again, for taking your time um, to join us in this webinar, uh, which I think is quite interesting um, because we do not only have Gustav and Lisan today, but we also have Leonard uh, joining us um, from this side up, who will be introduced later to you, um, to Gustavo. Um, so first, um, Gustavo, you can go to the next slide. Um, so here we are today for tips on doing business with European coffee buyers. And um, well, as I said, Lena will be introduced to you later on in this, um, after my short, very short presentation on uh, CBI. Next slide, please. So I am, my name is Jan Tirut and I'm program manager for CBI on the market intelligence um, uh, market studies. I'm uh, responsible for the sector's coffee, but also for cocoa and home decoration, and home textiles. And previously I have uh, my history, uh, working history in coffee trade myself for more than 25 years. Next slide, please. Um, so for the ones um, that do not know CBI um, yet, we are the center for the promotion of imports from developing countries. And we have our mission to connect small to medium sized exporters uh, to the European market in order to strengthen their economic, social and environmentally sustainability. And um, recently we have also added that focus on regional markets. Um, to reach this, we offer practical uh, solutions to um, have the obstacles that we uh, experience in the export value chain. Um, such as we have market intelligence studies because a big bottleneck is market information and that's why we're also here today to share with, with, with you this kind of information. And um, besides that we create value through knowledge and um, trying to develop uh, networks in the European market and together with developing uh, countries in our sectors that we are active. Next please. These are our target countries. Um, we post them on our website. Um, next, please. And these are our 14 sectors we are, uh, where we are active with our projects. And well, of course, amongst them, coffee. Next, please. And we provide um, for free on our website uh, market information studies. And so what can you expect from that? We have um, divided them into market analyzed studies, market entry studies. And market analyzed studies is the demand in Europe and what is the market potential for the um, and most promising uh, markets or countries and what kind of trends are in the European markets. And on the market entry part, we have different studies on buyer requirement, tips for finding European buyers, tips for doing business, or how to organize your export. And this year we have added tips to go digital, which is a new study. And for coffee, it will be published soon on our website. Next, please. And moreover, we make a country and or product fact sheets that depends a little bit on the sector where we focus um, a little bit more into depth into those promising export countries and or products. And we provide free webinars and we have pub we publish news items on uh, actual subjects that are uh, relevant in the um, in the coffee market. And of course, you can find all this information on our website. Next, please. And now I we go over to the most interesting part, and I hand over to Gustavo and Lisanne the presentation of the subject that we would like to um, explain to you today, and of course the introduction to Leonard. Hi. Yes. So um, I will first uh, introduce myself. I'm Lisanne Grothuis, and I am the uh, market research for the CBI studies for both the coffee and the cocoa sector. Um, and I work for a Dutch consultancy firm uh, called Profound um, and together with the team we facilitate sustainable trade promotion um, mainly by providing market intelligence services uh, but also by uh, um, services around support and compliance and also by facilitating uh, 
market access activities. Um, and this specific CBI work I do together with my uh, colleague Gustavo. So um, please introduce yourself, Gustavo. I'm Gustavo Ferro. Uh, I'm an independent consultant, but for the studies for CBI, I work in a, uh, with Profound. I'm hired by Profound to do the studies uh, for CBI. I have been doing the studies since 2008, actually, somehow working on the coffee studies and on the cacao studies as well. And I'm doing some work for other organizations as well related to the coffee market, like UNCTAD and for CBI as well. I have done some other activities such as the value chain analysis for connecting Central America. And you can see a list here of some other activities I've been doing in the sector. And um, yeah, Lizanne, we introduced uh, today's agenda to you guys. Yeah, so I will first uh, introduce uh, what you can expect today before we uh, move on to, to Leonard and this side up coffees. So the aim of, of today's session is, is mainly to gain some practical insights into how to do uh, business in Europe with European coffee buyers, uh, how to reach out to them, uh, and also how to build long-lasting uh, relationships with, with European coffee buyers. Um, and this session will be uh, some sort of a, like an interview style, like a, like a conversation, um, where Gustavo and myself, where, where we will introduce uh, a topic, and then uh, we will ask uh, Leonard several questions, uh, and he can just yeah, share his experience and, and his um, view on the topic. And um, the topics we will uh, want to discuss is first, more generally, like what coffee buyers are looking for, uh, then move on to uh, how to maintain or yeah, maintaining a business relationship in Europe, followed by uh, issues of, of compliance and also non-compliance. And um, if time allows, we would, um, um, no, sorry, before the Q&A, we will actually um, have a very brief um, overview of, of the current impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, the coffee sector and also how that has um, uh, impacted um, yeah, doing business as a coffee trader. Um, and I would like to make one uh, disclaimer that uh, it is uh, uh, Leonard and the side of coffee. We use it as a case study just to provide uh, additional insights and information about how, how, how doing business works in Europe. Uh, but it's not an open invitation um, to, to say it uh, like that, to uh, flood our guest uh, um, uh, inbox with many emails. So what we would like to uh, suggest is if you have questions um, of any sort, please send them to CBI uh, and then we can try to answer them. Uh, and in maybe specific cases, we can forward our requests if Leonard uh, agrees uh, to, towards him. But the idea is to send any questions uh, to CBI first. Um, so yeah. Thank you uh, for understanding that. Um, and then, um, yeah, we can move to the next slide. Yeah, just I wanted to remind you guys that we have had previous uh, webinars. And this is sort of a follow up to the previous webinars because, in a, I think, an interesting webinar we had, which is a little bit the basis for this one, is finding buyers. So we give you guys some tools on how to find but also assess if a buyer is suitable for you or not based on a few parameters and we invite you guys to visit the website of uh, cbi and also look at the previous webinars we have done and also to remind you guys that uh, on the website of cbi we also have a module which is how to, uh, tips on doing business on the coffee sector so this is the topic of today's conversation and also to remind you guys there is existing literature already on the website. So we invite you guys to read that one as well. Uh, I'll let Leonard actually introduce himself, not myself, because I think uh, it's nicer to hear from him. <laughs> he can freestyle to introduce himself and the company. First of all, thank you very much for the introduction, for allowing me to speak here. Um, so my name is Leonard Clerks. I founded this site up um, in 2013 as a originally as a direct trade platform which is a bit of a paradox because we are indeed an importer but the idea really is to strengthen roasters and uh, producers relationships with each other by creating very strong and independent uh, producing partners so that's uh, we, we really feel that um, you know, direct and open, transparent communication creates empathy along the chain, changes the whole price discussion into a value discussion, 
and um, in the end, when when all the people in the middle when they open up, that's where we found that's how we that's how you create trust. That's the easiest way to create trust in a very in a world filled with um, people taking advantage of farmers. So um, yeah, seven years down the road, we're we're growing fast and we're we're very happy with what we achieved and yeah, nothing has changed uh, in our vision except uh, that we are now finally able to do the things that we always wanted to do is really um, with the volumes that we have, we can really create the impact that we always wanted to have. So, Leonard, what is the main buyer type that you have? Who is your type of client? Like, is it smaller roasters? Is it medium-sized yeah. roasters? So initially, very small specialty coffee um, roasters, in-shop roasters. Um, what we found since 2013 is that a lot of them, they switched from having their cafe and the roaster in the cafe being, yeah, having to buy a, a, a larger roaster because uh, they couldn't fit anymore. And now a lot of them roast in large industrial facilities and we've, we've grown with them. So from the outset, we were the preferred supplier for very small, idealistic, um, uh, specialty coffee roasters, but they, at some point, they also needed more affordable coffees for their bulk. And they realized you can also have the same values with, let's say, Brazilian coffee or, um, uh, or the cheaper coffees, uh, the lower quality lots from the same farmers. Um, then because we started offering these lower uh quality coffees too not just the high-end specialty we started to attract a different type of buyer which yeah. is like the medium large buyer or a, a private label buyer um let's say roasters who don't necessarily roast for the specialty coffee segment but for um let's say normal coffee drinkers but who are looking for added value because they want to drink coffee with their hearts so, yeah, uh, no, totally. Yeah. And that's a concept that also has grown, I think, on the coffee market. Can you give us an idea of how much in volume the business has grown? I don't know if it's something that can sure. be discussed openly, but yeah, just sure. get an idea of this growth. So we we're now we're if for for the average importer, we're still very very tiny, but we're uh, we do three hundred thousand uh, kilos this year. So mm -hmm. that's around. Um, that's that's what we do. We're in 14, 14 origins, and yes, <laughs> wow, nice, hey, hey, <laughs> <ready>. <laughs> perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so here this is uh, this is yeah, fantastic overview. So this yeah. is really how we want to work. We really invest very deeply um, in the people that we work with. So showing up every year. Uh, and every year trying to get more and more from the same people um, and not, let's say, shopping around for for uh, for coffees. But uh, yeah. yeah, so I'm proud to say that we only skipped one harvest once and that was Ethiopia uh, during COVID. But um, he had another good buyer like that. That was the only time we ever had to skip a harvest. Awesome. Great to hear. Um, maybe, Lisanne, do you want to introduce the first subject and then we go back to Leonard to ask the questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And also, just, I forgot to say thank you, Leonard, for being here and to, uh, for doing the possible and impossible to, do, to be here and mm -hmm. uh, for allowing us to hear a bit, uh, from you. Yes, also from my side, thank you. And I think it's very interesting to hear uh, well, about this side up and also interesting to see uh, like how this side up actually fits into the, the coffee buyer landscape. Because when we ask the question, what are coffee buyers uh, looking for? Um, there is, of course, not uh, one answer to this um, because there is a wide variety of buyers uh, on the market. And well, most or each buyer uh, will have their own approach, uh, their own uh, requirements, their own business culture, their own uh, specific interests. So for a coffee exporter um, and also a cooperative um, uh, 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 
who can manage to, to export directly. Um, before you reach out to uh, a buyer uh, or you want to do business with a buyer, it is quite uh, important uh, to understand like whom you're talking to. So what is the profile of the specific buyer? And here we give some uh, parameters. Um, of course, you can, uh, in addition to the ones we, we mentioned here, you can also create your own or additional ones. Um, but this really helps to analyze the buyer and also understand uh, what a buyer is looking for. And at the same time, also um, um, translate that back uh, to your own company and to your own mission to see if a buyer is actually a good fit uh, yeah, for what you can offer as, a, as an exporter. And here, some of the parameters, for instance, you have a very large scale sized uh, coffee uh, importers, and it's likely that they deal with, with very large volumes of, of mainstream quality. So if you are an exporter um, uh, with, um, how do you say that, uh, less uh, or smaller volumes, uh, but of very high quality coffees, uh, you're looking, yeah, you, you, you might want to target a different buyer. Um, and that also relates to um, to understanding like the market segment um, that a buyer is, is active in. Is it more in the mainstream or is it more in the specialty market or maybe maybe both? Um, and also it's quite um, interesting and important to understand the exact activities uh, of a coffee buyer. There are, are traders who are really uh, dedicated to, to the, the, the trading mission to, 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 to put it uh, like that. There are also roasters who might um, import directly from origin or there are small scale roasters who would import through an, an importer. Um, there are also retailers uh, maybe with their own um, roasting facilities that would import directly from origin. So there are different type of, of buyers with different activities and uh, yet yeah, uh, recommended to understand exactly where they are and, and also like who their end client is. And um, on top of that, um, I would like to, to just briefly mention that um, it's important to understand the mission of a company because there are uh, specific companies with very strict sustainability uh, requirements or a very strong ethical um, mission. And for instance, uh, these type of companies would be uh, more interested in, let's say, um, all women's um, coffee uh, co uh, coffee from all women's co uh, cooperatives or uh, coffee um, grown in an agroforestry um, system. Um, so these are all uh, parameters um, for you to yeah, better understand uh, the profile of a buyer. Um, and also in, in the next slide, like if you are uh, um, talking or trying to understand uh, a buyer, it's equally important or even more so um, to also know, uh, like define your own offer. So know the specific characteristics of your own um, uh, product. And then you can think about the varieties you, you have or the, the quantity, the quality, uh, specific post harvest protocols or other elements or characteristics that um, make your coffee special. Uh, for instance, the origin, uh, traceability, uh, the, the community producing the coffee um, or sustainability practices. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to mention and emphasize this because um, I think it is um, interesting to see how this relates uh, to uh, yeah, like the the the, the business operations of um, of this side of coffees, and also um, yeah, the main the first question maybe Gustavo I can ask Leonard right away is uh, for instance what are the main reasons uh, Leonard um, for this side of coffees to to work with its with with the current suppliers you're working with? Yeah, that's um it's a good it's a good question why. When I'm, I, I just want to go back these two slides and um, start off immediately. But it's a good. I think it's good if you're a coffee producer to see all of these. Uh, no one, uh, the one with all the uh, no forward. Yes, no back. <laughs> that, that's a lot. <laughs> see all of these people as facilitators. These are not your customers. These are um middlemen who can you can have a friendly relationship with who will hopefully buy into your your dream and to buy into what you do so that they can sell to customers and um what i think is the strongest and most let's say future proof approach is to um to try to go one step further and to try to find your own 
customers, the people who are really going to talk about your coffee and are going to sell your your coffee. And when 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 that as an introduction to my to the question, what are coffee buyers looking for? They are looking for um, in our case, a dream to invest in. So the coffee has to be good, of course. The coffee has to fit the market segment. But more than anything, um, uh, we, yeah, we offer a different way to look at the coffee value chain where it's really possible, even as a small roaster, but also as a large roaster, even as a coffee customer, to really get close to the to the the life of the coffee farmer, and um, that even even if uh, not a lot of buyers yet are looking for it, they are starting to realize that it is a message that is very sticky. You know, it's a it's it's a way to distinguish yourself in a very saturated market, and. Um, I see all around me that small scale importers, small scale exporters, even cooperatives who have active Instagram communication and Facebook communication and are reaching out to customers directly, they will find one of these uh, one of these people to facilitate their trade. And what can happen sometimes is, we recently had a situation like this where um, in uh, we introduced somebody, a, a cooperative, to a German trader uh, because they needed to get the coffee from Uganda to, uh, to, to the Netherlands and we couldn't do it. And we saw that this trader really liked the coffee and started buying more of it and offering it to 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 others so by having a direct relationship it's also a way to because you're then you're you're asking a trader to facilitate your trade and they will cup it they will they will they will look at it. they will have a look at it and um in this case they went from just maybe 80 bags to of to a full container because this german trader liked the coffee so it's actually not just a way to get stable relationships, but even to get better relationships with um, with the middlemen is to have your own relationships with coffee roasters, which is easier than ever nowadays. So, yeah, that's um, maybe an elaborate answer, but uh, I think it's it's important. Yeah. Can I ask you what uh, this setup took into account when you had? these origins in your portfolio what were the reasons why these origins were specifically there and what were the aspects that you're looking for when you selected them um we actually apart from rwanda the first when 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 i started out um all the others they kind they came to us so we were kind of in a luxury position where uh we could just select from a gut feeling what was uh what what fits let's say but if i look at the criteria looking back the things that all of them have in common um we have we we don't we don't have a a let's say a certain type of of partner in some case in colombia it's a it's a family in 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 ethiopia and india it's a private estate in rwanda congo uganda the cooperatives in indonesia so it's it's really about having for us a partner that is both business savvy and has a um a vision for his or her community so like this side up the our partners in origin are also social businesses mm -hmm. that's the in whatever form i think that's the only con uh, common denominator all right. Yeah, that was my next question. What type of partners you're looking for? But you already answered that is not a specific. Could be farmer groups. It could be co-ops. So that's a good answer because you're looking at other denominators. Uh, what are the main risks that you're avoiding when you're sourcing from specific origins? What are some of the things that you're looking at besides the social impact? Of course, are there any things in quality in the quality management in the process mm -hmm. management that you're looking at specifically? Uh, 
Yes, I think we we're always very careful when we start with a new partner. So I think it's also important as a as a coffee producer to have a long breath with uh, with new partners because we in most origins we started out with something like 40 and 50 bags um, consolidated with other coffee from another importer or in in whatever way just to get an idea of uh the market fit mm -hmm. and just to see what problems arise because there are always problems in yeah. the in the in the value chain so we try to with a small shipment um try to get a lot of these problems out of the way because in the end looking from the point of view of an importer if we are stuck with one har one container of coffee for a long time that that um that would have threatened our whole existence we, we are um we can we can do well with 12 origins 13 origins if we don't sell one container of coffee then very quickly uh, as a as a as an importer you you can go bankrupt so you have yeah. to be very you have to be very uh careful in that regard so um i think what we've what we've been doing very steadily is not uh selling coffee spot so but but selling coffee when it's still on the trees so because we come back to the same buyer every year but sorry to the same uh, producer every year we also see that um coffee roasters start to promote the origins and it becomes kind of a brand. It becomes something recognizable for their customers, and they want it year in, year out. And if they if they buy the coffee uh, earlier in the season, that's good for the producer because we can get them uh, financing, harvest financing based on a contract. And we can it's good for the for the coffee uh, roaster because we can give them a discount because we don't have to spend any time selling this coffee. Yeah. So um that's um i think those are important parameters maybe my last question on this very subject uh i see that of course uh for an importer it's important to have a certain market demand for the coffee so that you can sort of channel it through the chain and get it bought have you ever pushed any origin have you ever believed in any origin that you actually had to introduce and promote it to the market yeah Yes, for sure. Um, a good example is Thailand. I mean, nobody buys coffee from Thailand because it's it's really expensive, <laughs> and there's a very strong local market, so they don't need to export actually. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I believe I believe in the origin a lot because I think it's kind of a it's a window to the future of uh, of coffee trade where you have relatively well off farmers talking directly to local roasters and making plans together and yeah so i think it i would say 50 50 50 like 50 percent of our coffees are, are are really have a pull factor from the market and the other we kind of have to push first because um initially there's not much demand yeah super interesting to work with new origins like that um yeah. Let us maybe we can go to the next subject. I think some of these questions will uh, come back because in the end we're talking about doing business. Uh, the subject that we would like to talk about here is actually these uh, practical tips on doing business with a coffee buyer. So uh, I would like to discuss around the subjects of what should be the first approach that someone should a farmer group, a cooperative, an exporter should have towards a buyer. But of course, it's not all about first impressions. So also we'll be discussing the kind of information documentation that you as a buyer or in general buyers expect from uh, these partners so that they can make a decision of go, no go. What are some of the aspects that play a role there in this decision? Some of the requirements, the main requirements that uh, you take into account. And finally, these are partners and you visit them uh, relatively often, I think. So we'll be discussing these issues and Lizanne has the specific questions to actually get around the doing business subject. Yeah, I think the first question is, is, is according to you, like what are the best ways for a supplier, for a supplier to make uh, contact with you? Mm -hmm. mm. 
if if I if I look at how um, how almost all of the producers got in touch with me, it was either through an introduction or through an email. And um, I think writing writing a good email is very important. Um, I think coffee importers get flooded with emails from, from so you might think that it's that you know in in a sea of emails how am I going to stand out but you know if you're lucky then people will read will read them and then from from that some uh, uh, an email that is written personally to uh to the particular importer and really where 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 I saw that the values were the same um that's that's kind of what start what will start the conversation in most cases um even better is of course uh an introduction through somebody that uh i or we already trust so then you get you you kind of transfer the trust the problem is of course when you start cold there is no trust yet so um any way you can bridge that is uh is very important yeah. So in the, in this email, would you also expect, um, and maybe this also relates to a larger um, uh, a point, like if you uh, already expect information on on the on the product offer, like on on volumes or quality that they offer, that 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 the producer can offer, or it's more like um, what you say, like just the sharing of. Yeah, I think. Uh, Maybe maybe we're we're not we're not a very typical um, coffee buyer because in general we don't really care about the coffee <laughs> we care about the people in first in first sense and then the coffee will be a natural will be a, a um, so yeah a, a succession from there so I think um, personally for me it's it's important to see that the that there is a common vision that there is a reason for us to work together now but also in 10 years so and that's um that basically means really kind of uh showing the mission that you're on why are you doing this are you doing this to sell coffee or are you are you doing this to for your community how are you helping why why are you doing something different and then i also want to add again that um because of uh, because because I mean Instagram is really a good way to promote your coffee. <laughs> it's really it's really very uh, undervalued. Um, it's it's a it's a place where you can really show what you're doing literally, and um, it's widely believed that Instagram is very is a very shallow medium. But we really feel the opposite. You can really tell a story um, tell a story there, and then. You you give a potential buyer, whether it's a roaster or a, or an importer, you give him or her the opportunity to uh, to browse, to mm -hmm. to go sort of to go deeper at their own pace. Um, so I think having a good um, Instagram profile is uh, is is a, is a great way to connect one step deeper to the market, but also to let's say to have some more meat if you will like I, I just accept that email where you where you can yeah get a better idea of who you're who you're dealing with the yeah. imagery so, part right i guess it's something that mm -hmm. yeah so be, besides the the instagram and and how you yeah email how you are in touch with with your suppliers uh, I, like how much contact do you have usually with with your suppliers and and how often do you visit origin I think you froze. He froze. Let's see if the it comes back. Yeah, it was okay. So I was just curious, like, how much contact do you have with your suppliers, and if you visit Origin, uh, how often do you visit Origin? Uh, usually. Uh, well. Not so much, actually. <laughs> so, of course, at some point, it's really important to to meet to see each other and 
we have met everyone we work with in person, either here or in origin. Um, but we find that the longer the, the the longer the relationship lasts, the more you're in touch with each other weekly. Uh, anyway, you know, it's like with uh, good friends living 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 abroad when you 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 talk to each other. Um, I think especially now also with the with the COVID situation, um, yeah, it really proved that relationships can really be maintained and even grow very well online. Yeah. But to really like to spend time in origin, to spend time to really understand is is, is invaluable. Of course, you really, I, I, yeah, the, 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 the more and the sooner you can get a potential customer to come to you, the more you solidify the relationship, there's no doubt. Yeah. Do you think trade fairs and uh, coffee festivals are still a way, uh, maybe to meet existing partners, but also for partners to be in touch with maybe uh, the end buyers or with consumers is something that you would encourage once COVID has been a little bit yeah. uh, alleviated and that people can go again to the festivals and trade shows. It's something that you see that is still on? Um, on the one hand, yes. Uh, you have to realize, of course, that you're in a very big, you're, you're a small fish in a very big pond when you're at a trade show. So um, a lot of people will 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 be showcasing their um, the, yeah their product and claiming the attention of relatively few buyers. So uh, I especially I encourage uh, growers to go to trade shows to meet other to meet other growers just to be inspired yeah um yeah uh which trade show like what are some of the trade shows or festivals that you would recommend that are good examples like the world of coffee is it something that usually yeah yeah, yeah the world of coffee is definitely the is definitely the best one i mean for european um for for, for the european market um we really encourage everyone to go to go there yeah because it's really the, the it's the it's the you won't just meet the the farmers from this one or the roasters from this one country but from all over europe so yeah if you have one one voyage and you can afford then that's the one that's the one yeah, I think you said something nice that it's a pool of, uh, it's a representative pool of the sector that you have the opportunity to do a lot of things all in a couple of days, right? I think that's the big advantage of actually going to such events. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, maybe we go to the next subject just to mm -hmm. talk about yeah. compliance. Yeah, so compliance first, I just wanted to, oh, I have to sneeze, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, Look at the light. Uh, yeah, no. The um, uh, compliance, of course, very important topic in coffee trade and any trade. Um, and it means, on the one hand, complying with legal requirements, uh, well, to be allowed uh, access on the European market. And we made a also a fact sheet on on buyer requirements, where you can just see all the legal uh, and also additional buyer requirements uh, on the website. So we will not go um, into detail about these, um, but. What is important that besides the, the legal requirements, there are also additional buyer requirements, and these often revolve around um, quality criteria, uh, social responsibility, sustainability practices, um, and also some buyers uh, would require, for instance, a specific certification um, uh, of, for your coffee to, 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 to source certified coffees. Um, yeah, so uh, Gustavo, maybe yeah maybe uh, w w maybe before asking my first question and i have uh, another question that i'd like to add here uh leonard you guys have started working on the private label etc did, did you see that you had to carry along these compliance issues more strictly regarding certification for example did it grow for you guys to manage compliance when you grew in volume as well um when you talk about compliance you mean Literally, you mean like ISO standards or organic certification, these types exactly. of things, or yeah, or yeah. certifications, yeah. So, other certifications, yeah. Yeah, 
so I, again, I don't think we're very representative of the sector here because um, we, we really uh, yeah, don't really support certification uh, because because we feel that our trans the transparent uh, relationship with trustworthy partners, if you have 3,000 euro to spare, don't spend it on certification, but spend it on reforesting your land. <laughs> So that's that's um, un that's that's one thing. So we've tried to stay stay away from certification for uh, for a long time. But we do realize that, um, for example, with organic certification, uh, it's been we, we we find that we hit a wall in some markets, especially like the French and the German markets. That uh, if you want to have your message come across then you need to be in a place, for example, an organic supermarket um, to even to even get your message across. And although I'm not a big fan of organic certification, we did become organic certified this year, um, just so that the efforts already done by our producers who do have the certification, that we aren't a block for that, you know? Yeah. It wouldn't make sense, yeah. No, totally understand this message. Uh, what is the main issue that your partners face? Not only really, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I had to, I had to let my cat out who was whining. I don't know if you heard that on the no, we didn't, but I think this is the nature of this virtual event, like this completely normal. <laughs> <laughs> so we are like, we were talking about, you know, uh, children coming in and all these yeah. things completely normal. So in your case, it was the cat. That's no problem. <laughs> uh, what I was going to ask you is uh, beyond certification, etc., but more in general, um, also related to legislation. Do your partners have specific uh, issues in complying? What is the main issue that they have faced in terms of complying with EU market requirements? Um, I, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's been very difficult to be honest because we, we we've never we've never really we've never had a um, a problem obtaining. Uh, to be honest, the, the the legislation is not so is not so difficult either. I mean, the the phytosanitary report um, and certificate of origin uh, is is yeah, it's it's quite enough for people to get their coffee in, uh, and also it, you know it, it, green coffee. Um, is is roasted is roasted at 200 degrees so there's a lot yeah. of uh, yeah, anything that would be wrong with the product uh, is then roasted out so yeah. it's very different than for example tea or spices um, we've we've never had we've never had any problems in this regard and I know that there are uh, mycotoxin uh, concerns for for some some coffees that we also really never had to there is one. There is one thing that we we have had a lot of problems with, and that is the import of cascara of uh, the coffee cherry, uh, because there is no official legislation for that. It's not a novel food category here in in, uh, in Europe yet, although it's being uh, it's it's being shown at EU level to uh, to become that. But right now. Um, yeah, it, it does pose difficulties. So we do our own tests to make sure that it is actually food safe. Okay, in terms of uh, in terms of contaminants, in terms of uh, the content, in terms of heavy metals, I guess everything yes. that I mentioned. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> heavy metals, yeah. microtoxins, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and yeah. Uh, what, uh, have you ever had an issue in terms of a partner not being able to meet uh, the quantities they agreed upon? And how should this communication take place from your partner to you to anticipate these things and not create a problem to you? What do you expect? Mm. How long in advance? And how should they apologize for it <laughs> or not? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, you, you already said it, like the, the, the earlier in advance everyone is in close communication, the, 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 the less you have these problems. But I want to add also that it's the responsibility of the buyer as well to communicate early in the season how much they want. Um, and uh, that is an enormous help, obviously. To, to producers if you can get pre-financing on the basis of your contract and the chances of you actually getting your coffee are much higher because it's produced especially for you. So uh, to prevent these problems, try to find buyers who are willing to invest in you. Um, on, the other, on the other side, yes, we, we have these problems quite, quite regularly. Um, and then we have to let down our customers because as we said, we, we, we pre-sell. Now we pre-sell around 70% of all the coffee we import. So that means having to let down uh, roasters. But um, yeah, it's always, I, most of the time it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something because we have a very diverse portfolio that we can solve. So um, yeah. yeah. And in Great. the end, coffee is a natural product, so it's something that uh, roasters also are used to. Yeah, it's something that is part of the nature of the business. I, I just wanted to quickly address the COVID subject because we saw that there was a drop, of course, in the out-of-home consumption last year because uh, the cafes were closed down and small businesses were mostly affected. And as I understand, that was the core of your clientele. Of course, now you have the medium-sized uh, roasters and also uh, working on the private label, etc. But uh, maybe what we'd like to hear from you: uh, How has COVID affected your business, and how do you see the market developments now in 2021 and beyond uh, in terms of this recovery? Um, we assume that coffee is still consumed, right? Like throughout, and it's as you can see here from Instagram, it's like a constant thing that people want. But how has it affected in terms of segmentation or in terms of the types of buyers that you could sell your coffee to? Yeah, mm -hmm. really, really good question. And by the way, brilliant uh, graphic. <laughs> Thanks, um, <Smith> <laughs> yeah. um, Let's just wait a little bit because I think it's just a connection. Yeah, and I also heard there are four questions from the audience, so I would really yeah. like to uh, save some time uh, yeah, for let's, that as well. Uh, yeah, we'll answer this question. <laughs> I'm back again. No problem. No, we already <laughs> anticipated. Oops. <laughs> okay. So, um, I was saying, your, your screens are still frozen. Can you hear me? We can hear you, so you can uh, Your video is frozen to us, but I think we will reconnect. Okay, so we've actually experienced quite substantial growth during COVID. And what we saw most of all, we were very worried because our largest customers, they sell to offices and that shrank to almost 2% of, uh, of, of what it originally was. But in the place came uh, the small roasters who sell from their shops they were basically the only uh little fun that people all over europe could have in 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 lockdowns or 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 almost lockdowns is going for your coffee so they actually experienced a lot of growth and a lot of these types of customers um they buy a lot from from us because they they want either high quality coffee or they want uh, relationship coffee so we we were very happy to see that a lot of these types of customers have grown and the other thing what i think has happened at home is you if if you worked at the office i don't know if you can relate to this personally like if you you worked at the office you just drank the coffee that's there but if you drink at home and you have more time to think about yeah. your consumption choices it's not just coffee, but everything you start to think about more because you have so much more time to, to, to consider these things. So 
we found that even though let's say the the the, the volume of the coffee sold in cafes which is usually a lower priced coffee that um that 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 shrank initially but in the place came much higher sales of much better coffee yeah so because that went straight to let's say brands who uh, sell coffee through the letterbox uh, these types of brands they 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 skyrocketed during uh, during Corona. Yeah. Um, and we're we're a supplier of uh, of some of them. No e-commerce in general, right? I think it was something that has peaked during Corona. And as far as I saw, it's really it's not growing so much anymore for 2021. But I saw that the growth that was already there is actually quite steady. It, yep. It, uh, maintained. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So in general, there's been a huge shift, and I'll, like this, this line is perfect. Because, but what it doesn't show is that the office market just plummeted, and at the same time, the e-commerce came in its place, and together, yeah. that's a flat line. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. These are the ins and outs of this flat line. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if we would zoom in, if Instagram would have zoomed in in this picture, then we would have seen that development. Yeah. Uh, Lena, yeah. I want for to. Answering. Ahead, no, sorry, no. I wanted to 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 say thank you so much, and I wanted to invite Yantin back because there are some questions from the audience, um, and I think Yantin gathered them for you, Leonard. So, mm, okay. <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank uh, thank you very much, all all three of you, and um, well, especially Leonard, of uh, sharing your uh, own experience and. Um, the, the way you work um, in this coffee world, which is, uh, I find uh, still a very amazing world. So we do have uh, some questions of the audience. We cannot answer all the questions, but they, we will answer them later um, to the participants. But um, there was the first question was because we, uh, you showed your origins um, that you are buying at the moment. And then um, this question was, you cannot buy then, or you cannot do business with Honduras, but I don't think it's a question that you cannot do business with Honduras, but you still have maybe not uh, have the relationship yet in Honduras, but um, maybe you can explain uh, why you already did a bit but specifically for this one that it's not a matter of not doing it it's a matter of who is presenting him or herself yes exactly so we we don't work in honduras yet simply because we haven't found the right partner or we've uh we've had to uh um uh, yeah spend our energy on the on the relationships that we already have yeah. so and and also we have more than one partner in some cases in one country so it's also not that there's a this side up monopoly of, of one of one cooperative yes. um rwanda and in uh, in congo we work with multiple partners okay yeah. and then you mentioned that in the beginning when you start a relationship you you might be then that you buy uh, some smaller quantities and now the, or maybe even because in the specialty segment you only have small quantities but the question is then how do you ship for example 40 banks without um extraordinary high costs of shipping those 40 banks because that's always a little bit i think the issue in the higher segment how do you ship the smaller quantities yeah yeah i mean you have to find you have to find an importer who's willing to do it for you otherwise it's insane otherwise you can't do it yeah. but um it also i mean it depends on the value of the coffee like i think around 80 or 100 bags it already makes sense like it's it's kind of a myth that you need to fill a container to make it worthwhile because um a container of coffee fcl is is not so expensive i mean nowadays it's very expensive now there's a container shortage but still it's uh it's 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 a small it's maybe like if you have a full container it might be 10 cents so if if it's a third full it's 30 cents on a on a on a coffee that's between let's say 6 and 8 euros so it's not the end of the world yeah so the cost could be observed in that um, enterprise yeah yeah, yeah. And then if you, what do you think is an, um, 
a minimum quantity that is attractive for buyers. If you talk, well, if we cannot really specify specialty coffee, but we can link it to scoring, um, to the SCA scoring. If you talk about coffees from 89 to 91, is mm. there a minimum quantity uh, idea of what buyers then is attractive for buyers, or is it depends really on quality of the coffee? So if you have five bags, 10, 20, or 40, it's not so important as long as the quality or the score is really high. Mm. That's, I think that's a very difficult question. It really depends on on your value proposition. Like if you have a, if you have a lot of different uh, uh, lots of five bags and you 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 are able to sell them straight to a roaster, then it's a fantastic business model. Um, but if you just have a few bags here and there, then it it, it could be very difficult to find a buyer for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I, I think also it's very important to have uh, um, cuppers and to to work with the SEA scoring. But it's even more important to 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 try to see where and how your coffee is being used. And that means going one step further and trying to understand the market that you want to be selling to. For example, a, a high scoring Ethiopian uh, coffee might do very, very badly in a fully automatic machine uh, because it becomes very sour. So um, yeah, then then that might also direct where you want to where you want to sell your coffee. So having that product fit information is, I think, just as important as uh, SCA, uh, let's say, scoring of coffees. Okay, I think I have two more last questions, and the other one we will uh, answer after the webinar. Um, but one is um we all know that well coffee is a natural product that from harvest to harvest it can change within the quality of the coffee due to ex external conditions or bad weather or good weather so how does this side up deal with um if you would have a quality issue how would you deal with it um yeah i think this is this is really um this is it's very important to to realize that we really we we come back every year regardless of what um let's say what 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 happens if it's not somehow uh, a human let's say if 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 the trust is there and we 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 still want to work together and then we will come back every year for example in colombia a few years ago the coffee quality was a lot lower because um, the rainfall stopped at a certain period, which made like the, 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 that fruitiness that comes out with Colombian coffee that 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 comes at the very end, where with with quite some rain. So when the rain stops, you basically have a very a chocolatey coffee that is that you can get from Honduras for half the price. So we really we had to work together with our roasters to. Uh, to to keep carrying this project, but I think mostly as a as a as a as a farmer you'd be you'd be screwed if this were the case because you really would have to sell for a lot very very low price and in this case then yeah the commodity market yeah I think that's why it's also very important to have such a sustainable traders or buyers like um, this side up. That is, um, I think, also uh, a change in the coffee trade market. And you see the distinction between, let's say, indeed, the bulk commodity and the, um, well, very nice flavors to very high quality coffees from different origins. And that leads me to the last question, which is from Venezuela. They are working there with indigenous um, uh, groups, and um, they think they found a, a new kind of priority or at least it's not on the market yet um, and they are wondering if there would be a market for that um, and if, if indeed if they would uh, determine that that is it's a um, a new kind of uh, priority if there mm. would be then a market within uh, the Arabica coffee within the EU yeah for sure definitely um, 
for two reasons. Uh, one, the uh, people, especially in the specialty segment, they are looking for these type of things a lot. Um, and also, um, almost nobody knows Venezuelan coffee. So um, there you have you have the origin and the the variety um, that is that is going to be novel. But I do want to say that. Um, these trends, be careful of them because they might last a few years and then the next the next thing happens again. So don't bet too much uh, on it and try to find, when you have these partners, try to find uh, exactly where the coffee goes and also make sure you get sustainable relationships with the final market. Um, I have a, some, some, good relate, some good examples are Congo, which were, nobody really knew a, a few a few years ago and then there was quite some developmental effort into uh, promoting Congo and then it kind of disappeared again and uh, Myanmar is the same uh, after after two years of heavy promotion of Myanmar and everyone being excited you see the uh, the attention shifting again and people not really coming back so um there's a lot of potential, but really try to ride this wave of uh, of this this uh, this trend and make sure it comes and becomes something sustainable. Uh, what kind of applications would be sort of sustainable in that way? Because I guess if it becomes part of a recipe of a private label, for example, then you kind of guarantee that you cannot replace exactly. it because it's, so that's what you mean. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. Yeah. Like when you when when you find your way closer to the final customer yeah. and you have your own brand as a cooperative or as a as a as a seller, if you have a especially you say it's an in an, an indigenous group you said, or it was yes. an indigenous variety. Indigenous group. Yeah. So they work. I mean, they work with uh, isolated indigenous communities. And we find coffee plants of Arabica for Arancy that could be dissident of the first one. So mm -hmm. they work with an indigenous group. Yeah, so this this is important. This is important really to 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 stress also that there is not it's not just about the variety, it's not just about Venezuela, but it's about this coffee, this specific coffee from these people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I could go on for much longer, but um, unfortunately, we are running over time a little bit. Um, not, I don't think that's really a big problem, but we do have to wrap up. Um, so thank you very much um, again for attending and um, this interviewing uh, help, to help the interviewing uh, on this subject and to help our um, uh, participants of our project and our listeners. Um, to, to further understand um, the mind of the buyers in the EU market. And Gustavo and Lisanne also, thank you very much again for sharing um, the presentation and holding the presentation. And I leave the last word to you. Yeah, thanks a lot for everyone attending. And yeah, thanks Leonard for making this uh, presentation more connected to buyers and to actually someone who's uh, working directly with partners and with buyers on the EU market. So thanks a lot for participating. And of course, thanks team for uh, hosting it. Very happy. Great. Thank you for having me. Okay, and for All everyone, right. um, a good night or a good day. And um, hopefully you will join us on our next uh, webinar, which will be announced um, on our website or via the invitation. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you.